Welcome to Calculus 2, video lecture number 7 on improper integrals. Now we have two main kinds of improper integrals, so we're going to look at each type right now. Definition for the first type. If the integral from a to t of f of x dx exists for every number t greater than or equal to a, then the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx is equal to the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral of a to t of f of x dx provided this limit exists as a finite number. And similarly, if the integral from t to b of f of x dx exists for every number t less than or equal to b, then the integral from negative infinity to b of f of x dx equals the limit as t approaches negative infinity of the integral from t to b of f of x dx, again, provided this limit exists as a finite number. So the main idea when we're evaluating improper integrals of this type is you're going to be see them written with limits either from a to infinity or from negative infinity to b. So a and b are going to be constants and you have to rewrite it, replace infinity or negative infinity with t and then take the limit as t approaches either infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so you don't leave infinity in there as the upper limit of integration. You rewrite it as a limb t approaches whatever. And you'll see that in plenty of examples. Now, these improper integrals are called convergent if the corresponding limits exist as finite numbers and divergent if the limits do not exist. And then lastly, you might see, this is still considered a type one improper integral where both the limits are infinity and negative infinity. In that case, you just have to split it at any number in the middle that's in the domain of the function. So you can split it at zero or wherever you're feeling. Um, and then we'll look at an example there and you would evaluate each one separately. And provided each of those separate integrals are convergent, then you could say that the overall integral is convergent, okay? If any of these two from negative infinity to a f of x dx or the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx is divergent, then the overall integral will be divergent regardless. Okay, so here let's look at some examples. Determine whether the integral is convergent or divergent. Evaluate it if it is convergent. Okay, so first thing I notice Oh my goodness, this lower limit is negative infinity. I'm going to rewrite it, replace that limit with t, that lower limit of integration. You could use another variable, but typically we use t. So here we have the limit as t approaches negative infinity, integral from t to 1 of 1 over 2x minus 5 dx. That has to, has to be the first step, okay? Take that infinity out of your limit of integration and replace it with t. Okay, from here, let's see, can we anti-differentiate this? Oh yeah, this one's no big deal. You could do a u sub, but hopefully at this point you don't even need to, right? So you just imagine if u was 2x minus 5, du would be 2 dx, so we're going to have an extra 1 half in there. Antiderivative is going to be natural log. All right, so we've got limit. T approaches negative infinity. One half natural log absolute value 2x minus 5. And then remember, my limits are from t to 1 now. Okay, so substituting in the limits of integration. Remember, we're taking limit. T goes to negative infinity the whole way through. I'm going to take this one half outside so it doesn't bother me. And then I'm going to have ln. Now if I substitute in 1 for this limit here, that's going to be 2 minus 5 negative, but I take absolute value, so now it's 3 minus natural log absolute value 2t minus 5. Okay, so let's see here. As t approaches 
negative infinity, okay? Here I have the absolute value of 2t minus 5, so that's going to approach positive infinity. Remember the graph of natural log? So as t approaches positive infinity, natural log is going to approach positive infinity. But then remember we have this negative sitting out here. So this whole thing's approaching negative infinity. The one half doesn't do anything. One half times negative infinity, it's still going towards negative infinity. So this limit is negative infinity. What does that mean? This is a divergent integral. Okay. And remember the integral if you have a definite integral, it represents the area underneath the curve of a function. In this case, there's just too much area underneath the curve for that limit to approach a finite value. All right, let's look at another example. Number two, determine whether the integral is convergent or divergent. Evaluate it if it is convergent. Okay, what to do? Start off every single problem the same. Just you can be like a little math robot. You go, oh, there's the infinity. Got to replace it. So I'm gonna rewrite this as a limit. T approaches infinity. Integral from zero to t, and then I have x over x squared plus two squared Ooh, dx. Okay, how do we integrate this? Actually, nothing too wild. We can just do a little u sub, and I'm going to do it in my head. That way, I don't have to mess with the limits of integration, right? So I don't want to have to switch these and play around with the change of variables. So I'm just going to imagine a little bit, and I'll write it out for you in case you, you need some practice imagining. So if u was x squared plus 2, right, then du would be 2x dx. So one half du would be x dx, yada, yada. All that means is I'm going to pick up a one half here when I anti-differentiate. So I have the limit, t approaches infinity, one half. And then look here. So I have x squared plus 2 squared. That's basically your u squared or u to the negative second. So increase the exponent by 1. Divide by the new exponent, now I have negative 1 over x squared plus 2. Lovely, and we're evaluating this from 0 to t. Very good, so here we go. You know what, let's take this 1 half out with the negative, so it's not so confusing. So we're going to have limit. t approaches infinity negative one half times now let's plug in the limits of integration so i've got one over t squared plus two minus one over zero squared plus two so just one half okay now we can take the limit so t is approaching infinity that means one over t squared plus two that's going to go to zero and the other terms are just constants. So all I'm left with now is this negative one half times another negative one half, which is equal to positive one fourth. Wow, wow, wow. So this is a finite number. This limit exists as a finite number. So this is a convergent integral. Okay. Nice. How are we doing? Let's look at the last possible scenario that could arise from this type 1. And that's when both the lower limit and upper limit are infinity and negative infinity. So what to do? You can split it anywhere in the middle, right? Because basically you're integrating over the entire real number line from negative infinity to positive infinity. So just cut it somewhere. And you would go from negative infinity up until that number, and then that number to positive infinity. And usually we'll cut it at zero, just because it's easier, provided the integrand is defined there. We'll get into that in a minute. So 
I'll write this as the limit as t approaches, or you know what, let me break it down just so you can see what's going on. So we'll rewrite this so it's the integral from negative infinity to zero of two minus v to the fourth dv plus the integral from zero to positive infinity of two minus v to the fourth dv. And then now I'm gonna handle each one of these separately. So this first integral, I'll write it as the limit as t approaches negative infinity, integral from t to zero, two minus v to the fourth dv, plus, and then now we need a different variable, dummy variable for the upper limit that's going to positive infinity. So usually we'll use s. So we'll have the limit as s goes to positive infinity of zero to s, two minus v to the fourth dv. All right, very good. Now, just do one at a time. So, you know, pick one and just go for it. Let's say we're gonna work with this first one here. So I'm just gonna consider the limit as t approaches negative infinity. So integral from t to zero, two minus v to the fourth dv, all right? So here we go, I have the limit as t approaches negative infinity. Let's go ahead and anti-differentiate. Two is gonna become two v, and then I have minus one fifth v to the fifth. Evaluate this from t to zero. All right, then this is gonna be, plugging in the limits of integration, we have limit t approaches negative infinity We'll have two times zero minus one fifth times zero. That's the upper limit. Minus, this is two t minus one fifth t to the fifth. Okay, so I just have the limit. T approaches negative infinity. Everything in that first upper limit is just gonna go to zero. And all I have left is negative two t plus one fifth t to the fifth. Okay, now be careful here because if t goes to negative infinity, this term would be going to positive infinity and then one fifth t to the fifth would be going to negative infinity. And this is an indeterminate form. If you'll remember, infinity minus infinity, basically because you don't know which one's growing faster. Infinity plus infinity, that goes to infinity or negative infinity minus infinity, that goes to negative infinity. But when they're going opposite ways, you have an indeterminate form. So what to do, you can actually just factor out a t and this works out pretty nicely. So this is the limit, t approaches negative infinity. I'm gonna take a t out and then I have negative two plus one fifth t to the fourth. And look how beautifully this fixes things because if t is going to negative infinity, then this is going to negative infinity. And then negative infinity, that's going, the three is to the fourth power. So now it's positive infinity minus two does nothing really. So that's just going to positive infinity. Now this is not an indeterminate form. It's a limit of the type negative infinity times infinity. And that's just going to approach negative infinity, right? They're both getting really, really large. One's positive, one's negative. So that it's all headed in the negative direction. If you had negative infinity times negative infinity, then that would go to positive infinity. Or positive times positive goes to positive infinity. So this is not an indeterminate form. Only infinity minus infinity. What sort of indeterminate products are there? If you have infinity times zero, that's an indeterminate form because they're not going the same way. Just think when they're competing, right? One's blowing up, one's shrinking. Okay, long story short, this limit is negative infinity and just stop here. You don't even have to do that second integral with the limit as s approaches infinity. Why? Well, since one part is divergent, 
we conclude the entire integral is divergent. Okay? And it does not matter what the other integral approach is. It could be a finite number, it could be positive infinity, it could be negative infinity as well. It doesn't matter. Game over, it's divergent. Right, now we're going to look at an improper integral of type 2. And this comes up whenever your function has a discontinuity at one of the limits of integration. So what exactly are we talking about? Well, you have a function and say it's continuous on the interval from A to B, but notice we're not including B because your function's discontinuous at B. Then the definite integral from A to B of f of x dx is going to equal the limit as t approaches B from the left of the integral from a to t of f of x dx if this limit exists as a finite number. It should make sense because the interval is going from a to b. You're not including b, you're including a. So that limit has to be t approaches b from the left. t approaches b from the left. Now, from the other side, if f is continuous on the interval from a to b, but notice we're not including a, because it's discontinuous at a, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx equals the limit as t approaches a from the right of the integral from t to b of f of x dx, provided this limit exists as a finite number. All right, and then we say again, just like before, um, the improper integral is called convergent if the corresponding limit exists as a finite number and divergent if the limit does not exist. And you could have a point of discontinuity somewhere in between the limits of integration, meaning somewhere between a and b, f of x may be discontinuous at some point c. What do you do? You split that bad boy up at c and then each of those you're going to have to rewrite as a limit approaching C from the left and then approaching C from the right. And same thing, as long as both of those integrals are each separately convergent, then you could say overall the integral is going to be convergent. But if either one of those ends up being divergent, game over, the whole thing's divergent. All right, cool. So let's look at some examples. Determine whether the integral is convergent or divergent and evaluate it if it is convergent. I'm going to tell you right now, these ones are kind of sneaky because it's not glaring at you that they're improper the way it is when one of the limits is infinity. So you just have to have your wits about you and go, oh my goodness, look at the limits are from two to three, but since I have one over rad three minus x, three is not in the domain. X cannot be equal to three. So that's where my discontinuity is. So since the interval goes from 2 to 3, here's 2, here's 3, we're including 2, we're not including 3, I'm going to take the limit as t approaches 3 from the left. Okay, so let's rewrite this now as the limit. As t approaches 3 from the left, we have integral from 2 to t, 1 over rad 3 minus x dx. Okay, and then this is pretty easy to anti-differentiate. You just have, think of it as 1 over rad x. So you're going to increase the exponent by 1, divide by the new exponent. Because of this negative, though, then I'm going to pick up a minus sign when I anti-differentiate. So this is going to be the limit as t approaches 3 from the left. We're going to have negative 2 rad 3 minus x, right? Antiderivative is going to be x to the positive 1 half. Divide by the new exponent, so I'm going to multiply by 2. And then we have limits from 2 to t. Very good. Now I'm going to substitute in the limits of integration. So I have limit, t approaches 3 from the left. This is going to be negative 2 times rad 3 minus t plus 2 times rad 3 minus 2, which is just 1. Okay, good, good. Now t is approaching 3 from the left. So if I substitute in 3 for t here, this entire first term is just going to go to 0. And all I'm left with is 2 times rad 1. 
So that's equal to two. That limit exists as a finite number, so then I say this is a convergent integral. Okay, not bad. Not bad, provided you remember. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna look at a very important theorem that's gonna come up later when we study infinite sequences in series, later in this course, and it has to do with P-series. So here we have an improper integral. The limits of integration are from one to infinity. And the theorem tells us this integral for one over x to the p dx is convergent if p is greater than one and divergent if p is less than or equal to one. Okay, so we're gonna prove it right now. We're gonna break it up into two cases. So case one, I'm going to prove the case where p is equal to 1. Okay, so if p is equal to 1, then we have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. And then we know we need to rewrite this as the limit as t approaches infinity, integral from 1 to t of 1 over x dx. Okay, this antiderivative is no big deal. We got this one. This is limit. T goes to infinity, natural log, absolute value of x, and then I evaluate it from 1 to t, and we get the limit as t approaches infinity. We're going to have here natural log, absolute value of t, minus natural log of 1. Now remember, t is approaching infinity, so natural log of absolute value of t is also going to approach infinity. ln of 1 is just 0. So what is this limit? That's right, it's positive infinity. So that tells me the integral is divergent. Okay, so I took care of the case p equals 1, but that's basically only part of it. Now I have to consider if p is greater than 1 or p is less than 1. I split it up this way because we integrate differently if p is equal to 1, but otherwise we would just use our power rule. So p is less than 1 or p is greater than 1. Here we go. So we have integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx. All right, so this is going to be the limit as t approaches infinity, integral 1 to t of 1 over x to the p dx. And I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as t approaches infinity, integral from 1 to t, just to kind of help us out, I'll write it as x to the negative p dx. Now, since I know p is not equal to 1, I can anti-differentiate as follows. So I'm going to have the limit, t goes to infinity, x to the, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, so negative p plus 1, and then divide by the new exponent, negative p plus 1, and evaluate from 1 to t. So now I'm going to have the limit as t approaches infinity, this is just a constant, so I'll pull it outside. I have 1 over, I'm going to write 1 minus p, it looks better, times, and then now let's go ahead and substitute in our limits of integration for x. So we'll have t to the negative p plus 1 minus 1. Okay. Now, as I take the limit as t approaches infinity, I have to break it down into two possibilities. So case one, within case two, is if p is less than one. Okay, what's happening there if p is less than one? Well, if p is less than one, then that means negative p plus one is going to be positive. So the limit as t approaches infinity of t to the negative p plus 1 over 1 minus p, 
would equal positive infinity, right? It would blow up. Since this exponent's positive and t is approaching infinity, who cares about the minus one? That's just a constant, that's not going anywhere. So therefore, this integral would be divergent. So I took care of showing the integral is divergent for p equal to one and p less than one. Now what happens if p is greater than one? Well, then negative p plus one would be negative, right? Because p is larger than one. So then the limit as t approaches infinity of t to the negative p plus one divided by one minus p would equal zero. Why is that? Well, think about it. This is negative, right? So if you had t to the negative second or t to the negative tenth or even t to the negative 1.2, you would rewrite it as one over t squared. 1 over t to the 10th, 1 over t to the 1.2. So if t is going to infinity, this goes to 0, this goes to 0, this goes to 0. The key is that that exponent is negative, so really t is getting large in the denominator, which is why everything's shrinking. Ooh, so what's that tell us? That the integral is convergent. Okay, and this is important to keep in mind because now we're going to consider the comparison theorem. And a lot of times when you're using the comparison theorem, you're going to compare some integral to a p-series. So you don't have to ever go through this integration again if you recognize you have a p-series. All you need to do is say something like, say you have integral from 1 to infinity, 1 over x to the fifth dx. You go, aha! Uh -huh. I have a theorem, and this is the p series. p is equal to five, which is greater than one, which means it's convergent. Case closed. Don't even go through the steps. We have a theorem, that's what it's for. So identify it as a p series, say what p is, move on with your life, okay? Wonderful. So now here's the comparison theorem, and you'll see why p series is so useful. So suppose that f and g are continuous functions with f of x greater than or equal to g of x greater than or equal to zero for x greater than or equal to a. So if the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx is convergent, then the integral from a to infinity of g of x dx is also convergent. Okay, so look at what's going on. We're saying f is larger than g and they both cannot be negative, okay? So their g is bounded basically by the x-axis and f. And if the integral from a, from here to infinity, for f of x is convergent, then the integral from a to infinity for g of x has to be convergent as well. And that should make sense because remember that integral represents the area underneath the curve, right? And if G is bounded by F and the X axis, then it has to have less area underneath the curve. So if F converges, G has to converge as well because it will also sum up in a way where the limit approaches a finite number. Okay, what else can we say? Well, if the integral from a to infinity of g of x dx is divergent, then the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx is also divergent. All right, so let's think about it here. If we take this integral from a to infinity and the limit is divergent, right? It's divergent because the limit doesn't exist. It blows up to infinity or negative infinity and f of x is even larger, then it has to diverge as well because it's gonna have even more area under the curve. There's no way it's gonna approach a finite number. Be careful when you use the comparison theorem because if it goes the other way, like if g of x is convergent, but it is smaller, you don't know anything about f of x. Like if g of x converges, f could converge or it could diverge, you don't know. So make sure you understand the statement and the way the inequality has to be. 
Okay, here we go. Use the comparison theorem to determine whether the integral is convergent or divergent. Okay, here we go. What is the problem with the integral from zero to pi of sine squared x over rad x dx? Do you see an issue? I do, it's discontinuous at x equals zero, holy moly. Okay, however, sine squared x over rad x, that looks like it would be a beast to try to integrate. So let's see if we can use the comparison theorem to help us. I know sine of x is always less than one, so sine squared x will also be bounded by one and it's not gonna be negative. So I can say sine squared x over rad x. Let me, let me slow it down. Sine squared x is always greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to one, which means that sine squared x divided by rad x is also going to be less than or equal to one over rad x for x greater than zero, which is all I care about, right? Because we're integrating from zero to pi. Okay, great. So now we're gonna consider the integral from zero to pi of one over rad x dx. What am I hoping? I just showed that the function sine squared x over rad x is smaller than one over rad x. So if I'm gonna try to use the comparison theorem, I'm hoping this converges already. If it doesn't converge, I'm out of luck. I can't use comparison theorem. Well, let's see. So I'm gonna replace this as the limit. T approaches zero from the right. Integral from T to pi, one over rad x dx. Now let's go ahead and anti-differentiate. So one over rad x, that's gonna become two rad x. We still have this limit. T goes to zero from the right. 2 rad x, evaluate that from t to pi, and then now we have the limit, t approaches 0 from the right, 2 rad pi minus 2 rad t. Okay, t is going to 0 from the right, so this is just going to 0. 2 rad pi is a constant. finite, so therefore this integral is convergent. So the original from 0 to pi of sine squared x over rad x dx is also convergent by comparison theorem. Okay, so I showed my function that I'm integrating, sine squared x over rad x, is less than or equal to one over rad x. Since that improper integral converged, then mine also converged or converges by comparison theorem. Okay, here we go. I've got integral from one to infinity of two plus e to the negative x over x dx. Okay, so what can we say? Well, 2 plus e to the negative x over x, you guys agree, e to the negative x, that's never going to be zero. In fact, it's never going to be negative. So this for sure is greater than or equal to 2 over x. You could leave it like that, or you could say this is greater than or equal to one over x, right? Which is greater than or equal to zero for x greater than or equal to one. And then now, if you wanna consider the improper integral from one to infinity of one over x dx, you don't do a single thing. You go, aha, this is a P series. Remember, p is the exponent on x down there in the denominator. p is equal to 1, and by our theorem, that means this is divergent. And we just showed that our function, 2 plus e to the negative x over x, is greater than 1 over x. 
So what does this mean? That the integral from 1 to infinity of 2 plus e to the negative x over x dx is also divergent by the comparison theorem. Always cite your sources. Just like when you're writing a paper, right? You have to cite your sources. Same thing in math. If you use a theorem and it has a name, cite it. Okay, so that's it. Your other option is you could still go through the process. You could have evaluated improper integral for 2 over x or 1 over x. It's not difficult. But since we have P-series and we just took the time to prove it, I wanted to show you guys how useful it can be to just cite it and move on. So that concludes the lesson. Coming up, we've got stuff on arc length, polar, all sorts of fun to be had. So stay tuned. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already.